All right, our first reader tonight is a writer who pays the bills by editing an online scientific journal. Her short fiction has appeared in several anthologies, including Predator and Prey 2 and Boondocks Fantasy. And she and her husband are in the process of moving to Chicago from downstate. She's been here before, so please welcome back to our microphone, Kelly Swales. I thought I would let you guys vote to see which story I would read. <laughs> I've got uh, one that I'd be able to get all the way through that's about uh, where animals in a school for where children. And I've got one that I would get through about half of a first chapter of a novel that's about um, using autistic brains <laughs> to engineer artificial intelligence. And it's got lots of family angst and medical procedures and nanobots and bacteria. And the nanobot or the um, where animal story has blood. So, so who votes where animal? Who votes nanobots and family angst? I, I think who, I think the where animals have taken it. So that's right. That's okay. The ballot box was stopped. It was fine. Voter suppression. Super right. This story is called Ma uh, Vanessa McAvoy's statement. Listen, I know this looks bad, but, you know, you weren't there. You didn't see it all go down. You would have done the same thing in my place. Maybe not. You're a cop. You're tough. So how much do you know about the School for Extraordinary Children? Mm, okay, you know what you've been told. The school really does have a primo PR department run by a chip from the East Coast. I think she went to Harvard. She's a real ball buster, but in a good way. She's got a hard job, and I respect the hell out of her. So, okay, let me tell you about the school. The real story, not the one you're going to read about in a fluff piece in the Sunday paper. It's a prep school, that much is true. Kindergarten through 12, and most kids attend all 13 years. We're not just prepping them for college and a high-powered life, though. We're teaching them how to survive in the real world. All of our students, without exception, are wear animals. Stop looking at me like that. You found a bunch of fur and feathers at the crime scene, didn't you? Bet you've been wondering how it got there. Well, I just told you. It's true. And don't think about getting a psych consult either. If you're concerned about my mental health, check my records at the school. We have an eval every year. You'll find it under Vanessa McAvoy, not Vanny. The stories you've heard about werewolves aren't all that accurate. For one thing, wolves are all you read about, but they're not the most common were animal where foxes are. They're better at staying hidden, so you never hear about them. Usually the trait is inherited. It's not acquired through a bite very often, though I guess it's sexier to be bitten, so that's what's in the stories. <laughs> it's not just the full moon that turns a human into an animal either. Some species have special triggers, and even, when there's, and even then there's some variation. Most will turn if they feel, feel threatened, and when they're really young and not in control of themselves, diet can play a role. Right. So you want to know about this morning. Last week I got a new teaching assistant, Tammy Wallace. She's a good kid, just got her teaching degree, but she didn't know what she was getting herself into. Most of them don't. We all went into this profession with this idealist notion of shaping the future by inspiring kids to learn. Once you've been at it a while, you see it's all the same political bullshit as everywhere else, and that some educators couldn't give a damn about the kids. Tammy wasn't like that, though. She was the real deal. She would have been a hell of a teacher, one the kids would call their favorite. Okay, I am getting to it. Do you want to know what happened or not? Then back off and let me tell you my way. Kids that age need a stable routine. Recess at 11, nap time at 1, music at 2, that sort of thing. Snack time is 10 o'clock sharp. I'm lucky this year in that none of the kids have food allergies. A peanut allergy in a regular kid has nothing on a chocolate allergy in a wear dog. Let me tell you. This morning I let Tammy make the snacks. Peanut butter crackers and milk. It wasn't until after one it wasn't until after everyone had eaten and had started to get a little squirrely. Not real squirrels. I don't have any of the Thompson kids this year. <laughs> then I got suspicious. I checked the little fridge and my heart stopped. 
The milk hadn't been touched, but the full sugar juice had. I had brought it to drink myself, but now the bottle was only half full. I asked Tammy if she had used the high-octane stuff. Yeah, she said. Why? That's when I heard the first quack. I could have strangled her. Sweet kid, but damn. One of the first rules of teaching kindergartners is to not give them sugar unless it's the <coughs> afternoon and you can send them home soon. <laughs> this is even more important with the wear kids. Sugar is a huge trigger. By the time I had closed the fridge, Eric had turned into his animal form, a cute little duckling. He's a shy little boy that already wears glasses, and those were on the floor. He waddled around and quacked. He sounded scared. I walked through the giggling classroom and scooped him up. He shook against my hands, and my heart just went out to him. The change is scary enough, but at that age, some of them can't handle the emotional side of it very well. Just try to imagine it. One second you're normal, minding your own business, and the next you're a duck with webbed feet. It's a wonder any of them make it to adulthood without running away or splitting their own wrists. I felt trouble in the air. After you've been teaching for a while, you get to where you feel bad vibes way before things get ugly. Eric was the most mature kid in the class, and if he had turned, it was only a matter of time before everyone did. I told the kids to get into their corrals. These are special pins that everyone has along one wall of the room. The kids use them when they turn. Once I had as many five kids locked up, this was the only time I'd needed all 20. I put Eric in his pen and locked the door just as a fight broke out between Sean and Patrick. They are best friends, and on the playground, you never see one without the other. But Sean's a cat, and Patrick's a dog, and so of course, once they turn, they're mortal enemies. <laughs> I heard a growl and a hiss and turned just in time to see Patrick knock over a chair trying to get to Sean, who had jumped onto the second shelf of the bookcase. Tammy asked why this was happening, and I told her it was the sugar. She looked pale and horrified. I don't know if she was scared of the situation or, or worried that she'd get in trouble. A little bit of both, I guess. She really is a sweet kid. Do you have a Kleenex? Thanks. Give me a minute. Okay, right. So Shaw and Patrick were going at it. A couple of the kids hadn't turned. A couple of the kids who hadn't turned ran for their corrals and locked themselves in. They knew what to do. We've had drills. A few others watched the fight, but the majority of the kids struggled with their own mutations. You've obviously never seen a wear animal turn, but let me tell you, it's horrible to watch. It's like a car accident, you know? Morbidly fascinating. The kids tell me it hurts, and it seems to hurt the kids who turn into bigger animals more than the others. I've seen it happen countless times, so you'd think I'd be immune to it, but even I've never seen a dozen kids turn at once. Jackson, he's the bully of the class, turns into an ostrich. And a gawky, ugly thing. Talk about poetic justice. He started to turn, his legs morphing into scrawny little sticks and his body plumping up. There was a moment when his center of gravity changed and it threw his balance off, but he managed to stay up. His screams turned to squawks as his face changed and his mouth turned into a beak. The whole thing took about 20 seconds, but when you're watching, it seems a lot longer. Once Jackson turned and started strutting around the classroom, Emily and Kayla and Megan turned. They're a fox, a mongoose, and a meerkat. Immediately, Emily started chasing Megan, who ran beneath the bookcase Sean the cat was on. The bookcase shook and Sean fell off. Patrick, the dog, started chasing Sean, and Emily, the fox, started running after them both. Everyone was making so much noise it sounded like acid, animals on acid being tortured. It's going to stick in my dreams, I think. Tammy climbed onto the desk and yelled, what should we do, at me. Tell you what, by that point, my only, was my only concern was saving the kids from each other. You think regular kids are mean. Try splitting up a fight between natural predator and prey sometime. I answered by grabbing one of the Jordans and chucking her into a pen. She morphed into a ferret, and I got her in the middle of the change. Her flesh crawled beneath my hands, just writhed and stressed and shrank, while the bones changed to their new shape. I tried not to think about it as I got her into her cage. As I closed the door, Emily yelped from across the room. I dodged a chicken, a beagle, two mice, and an eagle trying to get to Emily. Tammy had gotten off the desk and had picked her up by the leg. My assistant held the wriggling fox at arm's length. I yelled at Tammy to put her down. For one thing, any injuries the kids get while animals transition with them to the human form. For another, you just don't treat animals or people that way. I don't care what's going on. Tammy put her down all right, just dropped her right to the floor. Emily yelped again as she hit the ground. My, little heart, my heart jumped to my chest, and for a second there, I couldn't breathe. And 
then the room got suddenly, deathly quiet. All the kids, turned or not, watched Emily try to move. She got up and wobbled before taking one lumping step. She stumbled and fell and whimpered, a soft sound coming from the back of her throat. That one whimper of pain was all it took. All of the turned kids moved as one creature towards Tammy. The few kids who hadn't turned started to, and the ones already in their pen started throwing themselves at the door in misguided attempts to escape. Tammy had time for one scream, one long, guttural, terrified scream before the kids attacked. That's gonna stick in my dreams too. The four-legged kids started with their ankles and the birds swooped and pecked at her head. Her blood hit the floor and sprayed the chalkboard before I had a chance to react. I swear on a stack of Bibles I tried to get to Tammy. I pushed past a tiger cub and an antelope and reached for Tammy's hand. She reached for me like she was grabbing for a life preserver, her palm already slick with blood, and I yanked. She kicked the beagle on her way out of the melee. This startled yelp spread through the crowd and raised their anger up a notch. One of the birds, I think it may have been Amber, but at this point I couldn't really say, nipped at my wrist. Just once, and not hard enough, not hard enough to draw blood, but it got my attention. She chirped and looked me in the eye, letting me know I wasn't her target, but that, that could change. I, well, I'm ashamed to tell you I dropped Tammy's hand and backed away. Slowly, so I wouldn't step on anyone or get in anyone's way. Tammy looked at me with this look of confused betrayal as the kids attacked her one by one. I watched as they bit and clawed and chewed for a few seconds before running from the room and, and calling you guys. I broke some protocol on that, let me just say. If any shit hits the fan, we're supposed to go to Sheila's office and work out a cover story with the PR folks. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't want an ugly incident to get in the way of our reputation, would we? But after watching Tammy get attacked by a class classroom full of wear animals hopped off on sugar, well, I was too scared and in shock to think about covering anyone's ass. Imagine by the time you arrived there, there wasn't much left of her and the kids were all back to normal. It must have looked pretty bad with the kids all bloody and some of them in cages. <laughs> I can't say that I blame you for thinking I'm nuts. Honestly, it's in the school's best interest to let you think that. If I'm certifiable, then the cover isn't blown. I can't tell you what to, what to believe, Detective. I can only tell you the truth and hope that the evidence backs me up. Thank you guys so much. That story actually appeared in Predator and Prey 2, the, Be or the Beast Within 2, Predator and Prey. So, thanks.